so we turn to Venice now, um, which never came under Habsburg rule, and in fact remained an uh, intact republic until uh, Napoleon defeated it in the late 1700s. So Venice is an unusual um, entity within all of this Renaissance chaos, and in fact really served as a safe haven for a lot of people, scholars, artists, and other uh, people that fled Rome after the sack in 1527. So as a safe haven uh, for artists in particular, what we see is that after 1527, Venice really opens itself up to new artistic impulses, and especially with the arrival of Jacopo Sansovino, a Florentine who had then been in Rome for several years and uh, ends up in Venice. And he is named the sort of the director of building projects for the city of Venice, which is an extraordinary achievement for a foreigner in Venice. Venice had previously had restrictions so that foreign artists couldn't work there, or if they did work there, it was for very short contracts um, and it had to be work that a local artist couldn't do. Um, and that wasn't the case with Sansovino. Somehow he's able to get in and uh, get this important title, and he ends up really doing major rebuilding of the city of Venice. Um, we're here in the Piazza of San Marco, and there he is responsible for the design of these long buildings that they're actually on both sides of the piazza and in fact closes off the piazza um, into a rectangle. He designed those. Um, those are the offices that centralized the government and in fact he uh, even had his office and probably an apartment in this building um, so that he was close by with the many building projects he was responsible for. Obviously, the Piazza of San Marco is the sort of hub of religious and civic life in Venice, and that had always been true, at least since the um, since 1060 on. There is a large bell tower here that you see, and we'll look at Sansovino's project for the front of that bell tower and some other projects that are sort of around the corner from this bell tower. So as we turn that corner around from the bell tower, you see here uh, this library that Sansovino constructed, and it faces the Palazzo Ducale, which we've looked at before. Palazzo Ducale is that the place, the residence of the Doge while he's in power. There are also meeting rooms in there for the government. Um, there were series of fires um, in the building that caused it to be redecorated on a fairly regular um, schedule, unfortunately. And so uh, generation after generation tends to have the opportunity to repaint those rooms and we'll actually be seeing some of this um, 16th century, later 16th century decoration of Palazzo Ducale in a little bit. But for now, um, what I want you to look at is what Sansovino builds here. This is the Civic Library of Venice. It's the Biblioteca Marucelliana. And you can see that Sansovino was careful in that he didn't want to have a building that was larger than uh, the, the Ducal Palace. So instead, it's slightly smaller, though it may not appear so in this photograph but it's slightly shorter, um, but it's a very long building, and it's composed of a series of repeated, very Roman archways, and there is a triglyph and metope system that runs in the area of the entablature, and then on this level you have more repeated arches, and then you have a level, sort of a mezzanine level with some relief sculpture included, and you have this upper balcony level 
that also has sculptures on it. Sansovino had practiced, great, sorry, uh, Sansovino had practiced as a sculptor as well and is responsible for the sculptural designs here. Here's another view of the same building. So it really imports this Roman Renaissance style into the city of Venice for the first time in a major architectural commission and then in such a prominent place in the city. This is a major statement about the a change of tide here in terms of artistic style. Beside the library is this building here with um, these stories uh, that you see here. It's a very interesting kind of architectural style. You can see that there is rustication on the ground floor and then what he's done, this is by Sansovino as well, what he's done is put these kind of bands on top of the columns on both stories and it makes it look very much like the press that they use when they're making coins um, and you sort of squish down on each side and have the coin in the middle and in fact this is the mint of Venice where coins would be made and so he's kind of taken a playful approach and used the function of the building in the decoration of the exterior but other than that it is a very romanizing style again with this triumphal arch So as I've mentioned, he um, certainly was not responsible for the campanile that was already there. Um, there had been, as you see here, in the 9th and the 12th century, um, a bell tower here, but the foundations kept collapsing. Um, and in fact, even Sansovino's tower, uh, the tower, uh, even after Sansovino puts this addition on, collapses again in the 20th century. So Sansovino is only responsible for this area here of what's called the loggetta, this little loggia that goes in front of the building. And he added on this section to sort of update this area and make it more cohesive with the library and then with these office buildings that were over here so that, you know, he's trying to think about unifying the piazza. Here is another view of that same campanile uh, base with the loggetta. And what he's done, again, this series of triumphal arches. In fact, you have an arch and then a pattern of two columns, arch, two columns. And that uh, is a motif that we will see Palladio, another great Venetian architect, use a little bit later on. On the upper story, you have these reliefs. And the reliefs celebrate the, um, the attributes of Venice and the domain of Venice. In the center here, you have a personification of Venice as this woman. And she's flanked by these, uh, these personifications of the seas. And then in these um, relief panels, you have uh, personifications of the land and of the water um, to record sort of the, the dominion of Venice, not just in the series of islands, but also its expansion onto the mainland of Italy into the Veneto, which also was under Venetian governmental control. I've mentioned already this collapsing tower, but I should also mention that Sansovino did actually get himself into trouble not taking into consideration the precarious foundations on which the city of Venice is built. Um, the, the foundations are not solid. They're constantly shifting, in fact. And uh, this is a huge problem for any structure uh, that is made out of stone or that is very vertical, as is the case in the Campanile. But even in the library, Santovino uh, had made stone vaults um, and sadly did not take into account the kind of contraction that happens in 
with the cold air that goes through Venice in the winter time and that contraction made the um, the vaults fall in and it was such a shame for Venice and the Venetians were very upset and saw it as a waste of time and money and skill and Sansovino was actually thrown into prison though eventually liberated thanks to the intervention of some of his friends and he got his career back on track. Uh, this is another view of that same piazza to show you this continuation on the sides. Um, some of this postdates uh, Sansovino's time but follows the design that he had come up with. You can see here there is water that has filled the piazza. This is during the Aqua Alta which happens occasionally in Venice when the water um, rises and just fills up uh, this especially low point in Venice around the Piazza San Marco. Another great architect uh, that works in Venice and in the Veneto is Andrea Palladio. Perhaps his most famous building is this one, the so-called Villa Rotonda, um, also the, known as the Villa Almerico Capra. The Villa Rotonda is in the city of Vicenza, or right near Vicenza, right outside of Vicenza in the countryside. And it really follows the descriptions and ideas of the Roman. So he's modeled this after descriptions of ancient Roman villas. The Romans famously would go and live out in the countryside and especially in the summertime to have fresher air and better sunlight um, and escape the chaos of living in the city. And so uh, Palladio, who was a very well-learned guy uh, and, and really studied and learned from looking at ancient Roman buildings firsthand and reading about them, decided to build a villa that was as close in description as possible to what the ancient Romans had done. And what he's done here though is really innovative because he's decided to put on each side of this four-sided structure a Roman temple front that you access by going up a set of stairs. So it's the building actually looks the same on all four sides. It's a square building and then it's capped with a dome. And if you think about the influences possible for such a building that is square and then has a dome on top of it, I'm sure what comes to mind for you, if I get to it, is the Pantheon. And in fact, the Pantheon has that same sort of temple front that we see in the Villa Rotonda. In this image, you can see how the sides are the same, and he's really thought about the comfort of living in this space, um, the way he's designed, where the windows are placed, um, and even these archways, is to maximize the, the light that comes into the inside of the building and to maximize um, ventilation of the space. And so he really is thinking about comfort as well as uh, the beauty of the building and the ancient Roman influences for the building. It was seen as incredibly innovative in its time because never had such an ancient Roman building been sort of resurrected uh, and made new before the Villa Rotonda. But Palladio also built churches, and that's especially what he's responsible for in the city of Venice. He's commissioned to do several churches. Uh, we'll just look at this one, the Church of San Giorgio Maggiore. This is a church that's right across the canal from the Church of San Marco, and so uh, you see it very often in images of the uh, Piazza San Marco. What we have here is a very large temple front. Um, in fact, it's really a double temple front that connects with this very large basilica that uh, is behind it. And of course, there is a bell tower here as well. Here's another view of it. And you can see that what he's done 
is he's trying to follow again the kind of ideal rules of architecture and in that way he kind of goes back to those high renaissance ideals of Bramante who was an architect that he greatly admired. Um, he wants to try to figure out a solution to a problem that had been vexing for previous church architects which was to find a way to connect the facade in a way that really described what the back of the church was like. So instead of a facade that kind of hid what the interior structure of the church was like, he wanted to make that visible. So what he did was take two temple fronts. So you have this one that connects with the upper part of the nave, the highest part of the nave, and then you have this lower one that connects with the space of the aisles. He's got the colossal order of columns on the front, which suggests, as we've seen with Giulio Romano, that Michelangelo's innovation in Rome at the Capitoline Hill and at St. Peter's was being adopted in other areas. Here's another image of the same church. So this is just an example of what previous architects had done. This is by the 15th century Florentine architect Alberti. And to do the thing where there's the high part of the nave and the low part of the nave, what Alberti did was to form a transition by just putting these little scrolls on here. But these scrolls were only a few inches thick. And instead what Palladio wanted to do was to make that connection in that transitional space a real part um, from the front of the church to the real space of the church itself. And so it actually lines up perfectly with the actual structure of the building. This is the interior of the church and you can see it's white and plain and uh, it's a perfect counter-reformatory church in many ways because the Counter-Reformation, which is happening in this period, starting from about 1545 to 1563, comes up with new ways to think about um, the liturgy and how to best communicate with the masses. And one thing that is discussed is making church interiors less distracting, having less art, um, less frescoes and other things that might be 